conversation, um, <clears throat> you left us hanging. You had just met Mr. Iyengar in London, and I believe the year was about 1968. And then we're going to fast forward to your first visit to Pune, which you were saying was either 1970 or 71. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And I would love for you to just say a few words about um, arriving there uh, initially. And did Mr. Angar know you were coming? Absolutely. You did not go there without asking permission first. So I write to him and he replies saying, yes, come. So you arrived to the Institute uh, and what were your impressions? Did he greet you? Did you just show up for a class? No, I did not see him at the Institute until he came to the class. Um, so you basically you go to Pune and check into your hotel. Maybe walk by the Institute to make sure you know where it is. <coughs> And I would walk from the hotel to the institute in the morning. Did you know anyone when you went there? There are a few people. That I knew. you knew? Okay. Tell me, all right, so you're now in Mr. Anger's class at the institute for the first time. And I'd love to know what was going through your head as you were taking the classes. Were you like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Or Not, not at all. Or not were you like, all. I have found my teacher? I, I was very excited to be there. That. Um, I don't know that the word excited is even correct. I was thrilled that I finally got to see him. I was still working as a full time as an engineer. So for me to get that kind of time to go to Pune was difficult. Was it because you were studying at a depth that you hadn't had before? That, or was see, he? I had studied with Helena Thomas. And there was always the question of how can I get to the master? So. I was looking forward to it for almost three years. So when I finally got there, it was like I'm finally in India. <clears throat> so can you talk a little bit about those early classes, your impressions of them? Um... Early classes always started with you are in Supta Virasana. He walks into the class and he would say, Adhomukhishmanasana. That's how the class generally began. <clears throat> Uh, if you had to say anything to him about your particular issue or problem, you didn't do it in the class. You tell him when he's in the library, earlier or later. How many people are in the class? About 35 to 40. Yeah, he didn't take very many people in the class. Uh, that was for those classes. In a general class, he would take more people. Uh, I'd love you to say uh, how he, what you thought about his impressions of teaching in the early years and then you saw him progress. I mean, his teaching changed very much. Um, can you say a little bit about the style that he initially taught and, and how he evolved into something different in his teaching style? I think as he got to know you and know the group of people who were in the class, he would get more into more subtleties and deeper. In the beginning, it was like standing poses, outstanding poses, uh, much more adjustment, very little detailed instruction. Really? Yeah. Not a lot of verbal cues? No. So he would come over to each individual person and give them he would what they need? Them or he would, he would physically move them. Okay. But he's known for his um, ferocious style of kind of yelling and was that... Yelling, even, you know, little slapping. <clears throat> But you don't, did not, I did not feel that he was slapping. It was like, you know, he's what he described as, uh, I'm just bringing intelligence to an area. And I remember later on when somebody asked him, like, why do you hit and slap? He said, when a doctor gives you injection, do you consider it violent? Okay. This is a style of teaching. I'm not hitting you. I'm bringing more awareness to an area of the body that otherwise is lacking that awareness. And I remember, you know, like one time I was in Sarvangasan and he came in with his nail, nail on his thumb. He just scratched one part of the leg and it definitely made the posture better. So he wasn't scratching me, but he brought my attention to an area that was not working. You could still feel it yeah. after the fact, which brought your awareness to it. And it was an awareness that he saw wasn't there. Yeah. In fact, when I started taking the groups, I remember one time there were a couple of students from Berkeley 
who even when we were on the flight to India were saying something like, I wish it doesn't hit me, I hope it doesn't hit me. Yeah? And then we were there for two weeks and the same two people come and complain to me that I, I don't feel I'm getting attention from him. I wish he would hit me even, <laughs> but I don't the attention. That's really funny. So actually being touched like that, although some people would call it hit, was nice. It was an expression of love almost. Like I'm, I'm giving you attention. And is that something that you had gotten from uh, your previous teachers? That kind it, of that kind of attention of the spot or a little slap? Uh, or? A little bit, not much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what were the things, if you can remember that first visit, that you felt really surprised about? I was surprised about the smells in Pune. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm talking about Miss Dariangra's class. <laughs> <laughs> the city is a different thing. <laughs> um, were you were you surprised by his style, by his presence, by his command? It right? was all new. It was you know I had seen some of it from Helena Thomas, but he was a master at it. What was surprising was, you know, any time I am in the pose. I'm trying to do the pose as best as I can. And he's paying attention to that. And when I feel like, okay, he's not looking, I kind of slack off a little because I'm still a beginner. And as soon as I slack off, his eye is immediately on me. <clears throat> it was amazing. He did not miss very much. There are 40 people and each one feels like he's getting a personal attention. Wow. And what do you attribute that to? His presence, like how could he be that present with 35 to 40 people? I don't know, you'll have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were surprised in his ability to see? Surprised, pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. Like you, you begin to recognize that he is a grand master. Okay, that's why he can do this almost effortlessly. Please say a little bit more about what uh, you're calling him a grandmaster. What is it that you saw or or experienced in the class that you feel that way? All the teaching of yoga that I had before that was don't push yourself, do gently what you can. And here is a master which, who is saying you have to push yourself provided you know how to push. Otherwise you can hurt yourself. So here there was a confidence that if I push like he's describing, I will not hurt myself. Okay? Even though I may not physically like to push like that, it would be good for me. Can you give us some anecdotes that happened to you or, or things you saw with another classmate that were surprising? Like one time in Uttanasana, he says to me, you are not stretching your knees. And actually, I think I have a photograph of that where he came behind me, he was sitting on the platform with his feet, he was pushing my pelvis and he had a belt, a rope actually, around my legs and Gitaji was pulling me from the other side. And then when I felt that, he said, that is called straightening the leg. So you thought you were stretching your leg as much I as you possibly could as as and he showed you that you could go more. You could go more. But were you actually able to do more after they let go of you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Not as best as he would do with the of rope, course, yeah. but definitely better than what I was doing. Because <clears throat> the mistake the mind made is saying, I am doing the best I can. That was a mistake. Okay. Because once the mind draws that kind of conclusion, you have no reason to go further. Whereas the conclusion has to be, yes, I'm stretching, but maybe I can go further. So the attitude is, maybe I can do more. Maybe I can and do keep, more. And keep seeking that. And that was part of his core teaching, you would say, is that he would he would let people, or let me say it a different way, he would um, push you to more than you thought you could do and you'd be like, wow, I can go more. Yes, and again, his ability to push 40, 50 people in the class was just amazing. Because every one of those people has a different line and he knew what it was. Yeah. And do you know what he was seeing that he, you know, I, I've seen you teach, you know, seem to know people's limits. I actually have a clear memory of we were doing Pashimottanasana and this is, this is one of my first classes with you and um, you were going around helping people go deeper into it and you came to me and you're like, nope, not ready because I was stiff. 
and and you went you just went over me and, and I was you know of course I was like I wanted to get it <laughs> but you probably had that same experience with Mr. Anger yeah yeah uh, the surprising thing with uh, Mr. Anger the very first one I think was I was observing a class of beginners or relative beginners and somebody was in Virasan and he came and stood on them and my 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 impression then was that this person is already in pain and now by standing on him he's making it more painful but later when i talked to the person he said no that felt a great relief but he knew exactly where to stand how to stand where to stand so this probably intrigued you which i tried with my favorite students also okay yes. so was that hit or miss or how did you cultivate that that similar no, I would observe very closely how he's standing. It's not a casual. Putting. I understand, but it's also going to be different for each person, right? Yes. Yeah. You have to see where the skin is coming up, where there is red color, on. or if you can't see the color, you have to look at their eyes. Don't put all my weight suddenly on the person. Little by little, increase that. And did you only learn things like that through observation, or did Mr. Iyengar at all take you? Uh, and say, do you see this Ramana, or show you things? You did not learn that as much in uh, what, what, what uh, class I was in. You saw much more of that, I learned much more of that in helping in the therapeutic classes. Can you tell us a few stories about that? A lot of stories. Well, I mean, <laughs> ones, I'm sure there's ones at the top of your um, list that were like, wow. Yeah, in a therapeutic class, like somebody has a back problem and he would ask us to say, okay, you know, keep him here for three minutes in, you know, on a trestle. And he would go and start attending to something else because there are, you know, easily 20 stations. He's moving from one place to the other where there are helpers helping. So from a remote distance, he says, hey, Ramanan, is his time up and it's literally within five seconds of three minutes and then would he would he yell to you what to do next with him or would he come no he would say wait depending okay. on what else he's doing yeah or he would simply say second side so an incredible sense of knowing time for knowing a lot time of different and keeping situations. a tab on everybody's time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, amazing okay tell us tell us more about the therapeutic class I think something like, you know, somebody says, oh, this is painful, and he would not stop, he would go further. Okay. In his mind, there was a clear distinction between pain that is damaging pain and pain that is helping pain. Two completely different things. And are you able to tell that too? To some degree, yeah. And can you say a little bit of what you, what is it you're looking for? You just described the skin and the eyes. and. I don't think you can logically describe it but you get a sense of it. But you're looking at the person's eyes, their expression on the face. Even before I touch somebody, if, if they are afraid, I can tell that. The other thing I learned much more with touch, which Mr. Anger indicated, although he did not teach it in detail, is to say when you touch somebody, you have to immediately sense whether they're receiving your touch or they're rejecting you. And were you able to do that right away, or did that no. take practice? No, that took practice. I learned more from my students. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, anything else from the therapeutic class that sticks out in your mind? That you were. I think at one point I was helping a young boy who was more almost quadriplegic. You know, he had to be carried up into the class. And he could not miss, Iyengar tried to do Trikonasana with him. And he could not hold it. So two things happened there. One, he started doing Trikonasana lying down, which is the first time I saw that. And even he sort of indicated, yes, 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 lying down would be good. So for him also it was new. For Mr. Iyengar? For Mr. Iyengar. Okay. <clears throat> but then this kid, he was maybe about 10, 12 years old. And he said to me, I said, do it to him now, standing up, and touch him only on two places, as little as possible, but find out where to touch him so he, you can support his posture. 
So I very quickly found those two spots out on his legs that he could stand. And Mr. Iyengar was very happy with it. When he's happy with you, he kind of taps you on the back and yes. <laughs> but the teaching was that since you can make him stand up like that, in your own poses, those are exactly the points you should look at. Wouldn't it be different for everyone or not necessarily? Not necessarily. The root would still be the same. Okay. Because weakness for that boy or weakness in my body, the basic root is the same. There may be slight difference, but not much. And then I would go in the afternoon and he was there practicing. So I would try and practice the same pose that I was told to do with this young kid. And that pleased him. Because I was trying to find out, you know, how does this feel? So do you feel like you learned more from Mr. Iyengar by observation or by uh, anything he actually imparted to you directly? Uh, difficult, both. Yeah. See, whenever I felt like I was observing properly, he would indicate that you're not observing. When I felt like I was doing something under instruction, he would say, you're not observing. You know, it, it, it changed. An example of that would be when he first came to Berkeley uh, to make sure people were stretching their legs properly in Shirshasana, he would put f a book on people's foot so that you're stretching the Achilles heel more. Two years later, he comes to the same kind of situation and says, why are you people stretching your heel? What about stretching the toes? Okay. So whatever he would see in your body not happening, he would say, do that. Was that a little maddening to you? <laughs> in the beginning, yeah, that you asked us to do this. Now we are doing it and you don't like it. But slowly the understanding came that he is looking in the moment what is happening and teaching from that. And probably he was always that way, but um, back to the original question was, how, can you articulate how his teaching would change from when you started teaching with him and then how, how, how long did you study with him? 20, 30? Oh my God, I started in 68, so. A long time. We'll just I'm go still with a long time. From yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see. Um, but, but seeing his, his teaching style evolve with classes, did, was there a distinct difference? Not really. Really? So he stuck with how he was I, when I you think, first met him? I think, you know, if any difference that I noticed came after he had a grandchild, that mellowed him somewhat. But even, you know, even a mellowed lion is still a lion. So. There are times when he would he, he would really bring up that ferocious attitude. But in therapeutic classes that worked um, to an amazing extent. Okay, like one instance I remember this kid, maybe 22, 23 year old, was told by doctor that I don't think you can walk in this life. So he comes to Mr. Anger. And after working with him three, four weeks, I happened to be in the class helping them. And that day he decided, today he is going to walk. So I would hold his hands in the front and Mr. Anga would from the back push him. And after walking a little bit, he says, that's not enough. And he tells me, let go of his hand. So it's like he will fall. He says, let go, I told you. So I let go of his hand. And the kid is still standing. He says, now walk. He says, no, not like that. Take long, big strides. Okay. And I remember in that situation, everybody froze and stopped. Like, finally, Mr. Angar has lost it. You mean when they was telling you to let go? Yeah. Yeah. And he, he would yell, you know, literally fire to make this kid walk. When the kid finally walked across the room, he quieted down. He put his, you know, his clothes were by the Patanjali statue. He puts it on. He says, you people th thought I was angry. But this kid had been convinced by the doctor he can't walk. What am I to do? And, you know, people were crying, tears in eyes. Like, right. you know, within this a short, short session, he made this kid walk. 
and I saw that his ability to give you that kind of confidence was the biggest thing I got from him. I was no longer a weakling. If you ask me, you know, what is one thing he gave you, it is confidence. I can do it. Even though he was never happy with your posts. <laughs> his, his job was not to be happy. <clears throat> right. Um, it reminds me of another story you've told that maybe not some people have heard, but it was, um, I hope you remember this, but it was a boy whose arm, young man, I think, arm didn't work and told him, you know, I can't, I can't raise my arm or I can't, you know, it won't move or something. You know the details and the, the whole class. He was like, stretch your arm. And, and you said you saw the kid being like, I told him I can't do that. But then at the end of class, do you remember the story? Yeah, it was, I'm not going to name the people, but there's <clears throat> a very tall person in the class who is one of our students here. And we were doing Shirshasana. So this man had a congenital shortness of the arm. So he, you know, one elbow would be obviously higher. And Prashant and a couple of other people were helping this boy putting something under his elbow to allow for that difference. And Mr. Anga saw it from a distance and said, why are you people doing that to him? He doesn't need that support. So he stands up and says, but I have congenital short. No, it's not short. A complete refusal to accept what everybody could see that, yes, but it is short. Huh? And he worked with this boy and said, no, work without this prop under your elbow. And then he helped him in a variety of ways, but he refused to accept that this arm is short. After, I think, two or three classes, he finally gets our very strong student to stand next to this boy and says, both of you lift your arms. He says, lift as much as you can. And this boy whose arm was short was actually lifting more than the other tall guy. And he says, now, you think I could not see that he has a congenital shortness in the arm? But if I accept that, then I cannot push him beyond this. But today, look at his arm. He's stretching much better than even the tall person. So that kind of... It, he would say things like that, that what you people think you can see, you think I cannot see, that you are telling me, no, he has congenital shortness. I know it is short, but I'm not going to accept it. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amazing stuff. Do you want to, are there any other stories you'd like to share inside the classroom before I ask you about your relationship with Mr. Iyengar outside the classroom? Is there any other things that stand out in your mind in the early days? Inside this class, I think the stories that stand most in my mind are when I'm helping in the therapeutic class, where this kind of absolutely magical things happen. <clears throat> Inside the class, the story I remember one time was he is uh, somebody is in, in Prasitapadottanasana. So th their feet are apart and he's sitting there trying to help her knee, this, uh, this woman's knee. So he, he, he begins to ask questions like, so how does that feel? And when the person responds with, um, it is hurting, he would say, no, it's not hurting, it can't hurt. And you wonder, like, you know, this person is saying they are hurting, how can you say it's not? He says, no, you are feeling a sensation, your description is wrong, it's not a hurt. Okay. And that's where I first heard the phrase that when you were born, your mother had pain, would you call it hurt? Hurt to him meant something that's damaging. Okay. Simply because there is a painful sensation, it's not hurt. And so how long did it take you to learn to do that with your students? Uh, in England, it was easier. And I learned it there. Easier than? Easier in than in America. <laughs> Can you say something about that? Here, the, the, it's a very litigious society. I see. So you are, you know, you are conscious of that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back before I ask you about him outside the classroom to you said the sing. If I asked you the single thing that he gave you was confidence.
Can you say a little bit about the evolution of that? I'm sure it wasn't instant, and how long did it take, and what was it specifically that he gave, was able to give you that confidence? Specifically in class after class, <clears throat> to find that he can push you beyond what you think your limit is. Uh, one thing that distinctly stands out in my mind is one day on a Sunday with our friends in Pune, we decided to go on a hike. There were, I think, six or seven of us. Very tough hike up in the mountains. Coming back, some people could not walk at all. They had to be helped. Wow. It was that bad. And there were blisters on their feet and so on. So that evening, Sunday evening later, we were invited to have dinner. The whole group was asked to come and have dinner at, at, this, at the Iyengar Institute. So some of these people came to me and said, you are the group leader. Will you tell him that, you know, we are kind of hurt? So I went to him and I told him that, you know, some of us went on a hike and are really tired and in pain. He says, yes, yes, we will see. Next morning, the class was standing poses. <laughs> and it felt like at least six people are going to die. Okay? We are already in so much pain. But the way he conducted the class, after the class, everybody felt like, now I can walk easily. Amazing. Just amazing stuff. Um, okay, so I know you also had the good fortune of being able to spend time with him outside the classroom where he wasn't um, teaching you pranayama and asana. Um, can you say how he might have been different outside the classroom? or? I think the biggest quality I noticed from the very early on, outside the class he was amazingly accommodating and very, very generous. Also, outside the class, you know, unless somebody specifically asked him about yoga, he was not interested in discussing that. He would talk about, you know, go to a museum, look at some scenery, describe something very... He had interest in everything. That was amazing. That surprised you? Yeah, that surprised me. You thought he would just be, he would be talking singular and focused and everything would be yoga. Interesting. Um, what what do you make of that? Is this his active mind or curious mind? A, a mind which was always willing to learn something new. I remember in the beginning, even in the class when he was teaching, he would say, discover, discover. Okay? Constant emphasis was on that word, discover more. You have to find out. But he, you're saying he brought that he was in the classroom, but he also was like that outside. He also was, for himself, he was like that outside. <clears throat> Are there any um, stories that come to mind with Mr. Iyengar outside the classroom that you... That well, you the story was one of a surprise again. I was walking on the beach with him, um, close to him, and I was pointing at something, and he lifted his arm, and his arm hit me on my arm. And it was like a steel rod that just hit me. Had very strong arms. But he did not look that strong ordinarily. And what do you think that was? Prana? Energy, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tremendous energy. But he, I know he had a history of being um, a sickly child, for lack of a better word. I don't know what was exactly wrong with him. So, um, and then he studied with his teacher and got better. So do you feel like he cultivated that, um, that strength that you just described through pranayama? Well, Asana? I'm sure <clears throat> that you know, from his teacher, he got the confidence. He was, according to his description, he was a weakling, which I don't entirely agree because I've seen movies of him when he was younger. Okay, he was not a weak link. Maybe much younger he was weak. But he got confidence from Krishna Macharya to, to not allow that weakness to make him weaker. So do you think you describe the same ability in Iyengar? Do you think he got it from? From his teacher. You do. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? Any other stories from... In, in, in that same way, I remember him saying that you people think I am tough. Say, you should have seen how tough Krishnamacharya was on me. So in his mind, he was being soft on you? <laughs> Comparatively, yeah. <coughs> At least so he thought. Mm -hmm. Now, I have never seen Krishnamacharya Ji teaching, so I don't have a direct comparison. But the stories I hear would be like that. And how do you feel um, yoga affected or shifted or influenced Mr. Iyengar's life outside the classroom? Like, do you feel, obviously he had a, a, an intense desire to help people. Where did that come from? Did that come from how much yoga helped him? And how did, I know in his later years, he um, did a whole foundation for his home village. I think it was a mixture of several things. <clears throat> Outside the class when I first saw him was in England and he definitely had this sense of I'm not going to let you look down on me because I'm Indian. So that cultural thing was there. Uh, he wanted to prove that as an Indian I am even better than you. He won't say it in those words but that I'm Indian is not going to interfere with my teaching in any way. Most of the other senior students, uh, senior teachers, senior Iyengar teachers, which was in your circle, were Westerners. Later. <clears throat> okay. When I first met him in England, there were not that many teachers from the West. If there were teachers, they were all in England. So you had one thing um, that they didn't have, is you could speak to him in Hindi? I could speak to him in Hindi. Do you think that had an effect on your relationship with him? Oh, for sure. Can yeah. you say something about that? Well, <clears throat> one time we were in San Francisco. And I think the name of the doctor that uh, was in the story is Jacob Pasteke. He was doing some research on lungs. So he convinced Mr. Angar to come to the hospital so they could run some tests on him. So there are four or five of us went with Mr. Anger to this hospital. And as soon as we reached there, Jacob was called away on some emergency. So he hands him over to a nurse practitioner and asked her to run this test on him. So every machine that he went to, the nurse was kind of, you know, he's doing okay. Then one machine he came to, she tested him and says, no, there's something wrong with his lungs. So we all look at each other like, what are you talking? Uh, and she says, no, the machine shows that there's something wrong with the lungs. So Mr. Anga said, repeat the test. So they repeated the test and she said, no, you need to talk to the doctor about this. It is still showing something, some problem. So Mr. Anga asked me like, what are they looking for? So I asked the nurse, I said, why are you saying it is, you know, there's something wrong? He says, look at this. The residual air left in his lungs after exhalation is too much. It should be less. So I told him in Hindi that, Guru, this machine was not designed for people like you. Okay, machine was designed around people who have normal breath. So they are looking for minimum air in your lungs after you exhale. So he says, okay. I said, don't take a full yogic breath. Take a normal deep breath and throw it out. So he did that. And then <laughs> this lady looks at him and says, my God, I've never seen better lungs. It's all, all depending on your viewpoint, right? Yeah. <laughs> so machines, whatever it indicates, is based on statistics. Right. Okay. This man is not within the range of the statistics. So he takes a full yogic breath and when he throws it out, it's not as empty as it should be. But if you want him to empty his lungs, he will do better than anybody. And what did they use that study for? Did, they, did anything come of it? No, I, I don't know anything. They just wanted to see if the yogi could... Yogi, I think whatever the doctor Jacob decided to look at, he, but we never got any feedback from that. Mm -hmm. But our conclusion was Mr. Anga's lungs are better than anybody else's. 
and your ability to uh, communicate him, communicate with him in Hindi, did that come in handy at any other times you can think of? Uh, yes, but it's more political. So okay. I'm talk. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, okay, any other stories about Mr. Iyengar spending time with him outside the classroom? Well, one story that comes to my mind is when he was here in San Francisco the first time. <clears throat> at the end of a very long day, he's tired. And I said, Guruji, come with me. I want to take you somewhere before we go home. So he, he usually would agree. So he said, okay, let's go. So I took him up on Twin Peaks. He liked the air so much. Every night after the session, he would insist, let's go to Twin Peaks. <laughs> and what was he sensing? The air. He liked the air at the top but of it. It was clean? Or clean it was cleaner. Yes. <clears throat> then down below. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you sense that? Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, it's, this is the air in which I would like to do pranayama practice. One time I remember he was so tired at the end of the day. He was working very hard during the day. That immediately after the last session finished, he just lay down on the concrete floor. Okay? Obviously tired. So, when he got up, we took him home. He went into his room. Ten minutes later, he comes out. He's fresh again. He says, let's go to Twin Peaks. So, we were back on Twin Peaks. What, what did he do? A Shavasana? Shavasana. Mm -hmm. Conscious Shavasana. But within ten minutes, he was completely refreshed. Did Mr. Iyengar learn everything he learned um, by, um, I mean, let me say it a different way. Obviously, he learned from his teacher and from practice. And do you know anything about how much he studied um, the books of yoga? Do you know? No, I do not know. But what I do know is that when I told you that, you know, after the class, I would go in the afternoon and try to practice the posture he was telling me to do with this other student. He said he would do the same thing. He finds somebody's problem. He says, I try and imitate that problem in my body as much as I can and see what I would do with it. And then you took that on as your own. Yeah. yeah. But he talked of um, the very first time he came to United States. It was uh, many, many years ago, long before I knew him. <clears throat> and he came to Texas. And he was told that... Um, you know, if you want to be safe, get out of the country. What? Whatever he talked or said was not welcome. What do you know what he said? I, I don't remember ever hearing a detail about that. <clears throat> so there was a group of senior students, teachers here in San Francisco, and you invited him. And then maybe you could just tell a brief uh, history of how the Institute, I mean, the San Francisco is the first institute, the Anger yes. Institute in the country, right? So um, can you just maybe tell us a little bit about how that happened? Well, when I came from England, I had asked, I had just met Mr. Anger in England and I asked him, like, I'm moving to America, to California, who do you think I should contact? Because I knew he had been here before. And I think he gave me the name of Rama Jyoti Varnan. So I came and looked up Rama Jyoti, very nice person, very, very accommodating, very helpful. And between us, we talked and said, let's start an Iyengar Association here. And we named the first association as Light on Yoga Association. When he came here, he did not like that name. He said, you can't use that phrase. I think it's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> It's but a good name for a book, too. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> but he, he suggested the name uh, B.K. Sanger Institute of San Francisco. We wanted to name it B.K. Institute of America. He said no, of California. And then he changed his mind and said no, of San Francisco. Because there are people from Southern California that could object to that. Name. I see. But then how did the first institute end up happening in San Francisco? 
Raman Jyotis Varnan was uh, or is uh, a lawyer, so he helped us set up a non-profit uh, corporation. Okay. okay. And but you guys wanted an institute. We and, wanted an institute, sure. Yeah. Okay, so you told Mr. Yanger that you wanted to do this. You have a name, and then what happened? Well, first we were simply having a group meeting and teaching wherever we could. Right. But then it was decided to have a location. And there was a guy from Yoga Journal. He was, I think, the president of the Yoga Journal then. And the journal has just started. So he wanted to... Uh, no, there was California Yoga Teachers Association okay. where we were teaching. I was not teaching there, but most of other people were. And that association was, it was run by this man, with the help of other people. But what I saw was that he was not interested in Iyengar Yoga. In fact, he considered it not good. And yet, all the teachers teaching at that California Association, Yoga Teacher Association, were Iyengar teachers. So we decided, I was not in that meeting, but the people decided, that we will have our own institute, which this man tried to kind of take over, but he, he, we did not let him. And then who found the building at Ontario? Uh, I think the group found, I'm okay. not pretty sure who okay. exactly. Okay. And then didn't Mr. Iyengar come over uh, to raise money for it? Or I, I don't know if I'm getting No, he came it. and did a, 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 what do you call it? Christening? Uh, Christening ceremony for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories from that? Mm, not particularly, no. Okay. okay. I used to teach, I still worked as an engineer, so I used to teach that inst at that institute in weekend, or I had found permission from my employers to have Thursday afternoon free. So I come and teach a class on Thursday. The Thursday afternoon class that you still have. Uh, that's the, I still have. Wow. <laughs> so how many years have you been teaching that? Well, ever since the institute started. Okay. It's, we'll put the math in later. It's probably <laughs> 76 or 78. Wow. Um, okay. So you said that the, if you had to say the one thing that Mr. Iyengar gave you, it was confidence that you could do more. Um, with that in mind, um, can you give us two or three of the most valuable lessons or teachings that you learned from him um, that maybe uh, fundamentally changed your outlook either on yoga or on life in general? I think the same phrase comes to my mind again, that it was <clears throat> this confidence that I can do more. Um, the other thing was what I described as, you know, his constant emphasis on discover, discover. Learn not only from what is being taught, but learn from your own practice. So you felt his telling you that made you want to practice more? Did learn he... more from the practice. <clears throat> so did you feel like you had the same amount of discipline before t before meeting Mr. Iyengar and after meeting Mr. Iyengar? No, I had, uh, relatively speaking, I had no discipline before meeting Iyengar. Okay, well that sounds like a pretty big thing. So what what was the evolution of that? Why did you all of a sudden become disciplined? Before meeting Mr. Iyengar, I had this teaching of do gently what you can. Right. Within which there was complete freedom to say, you know, today I don't feel like doing anything and I would not do. So complete lack of discipline, really. Right. Whereas after meeting him, it was like, yes, this will give you strength and confidence and all that, but you need to practice every day. Okay? You cannot take a day off like that. So I remember sitting in my engineering office one day when there was not much work, engineering-wise, and this idea came to me that you know, once I am not working as an engineer anymore, I will have more time to practice. And then I looked at that thought and I said, no, that's not true. 
So I made a list of what was important in my life, what I did every day. And I was not willing to give up any of those things, except sleep. So I said, okay, I will try this. I got up the next day at three in the morning where nobody wanted me. I was still sleepy. I practiced from three to six, went to bed for about an hour, got good sleep, got up and you know had my breakfast and so on and gone to work. Three hour practice. Three hour break. But for the first week, that was difficult. After that, I got used to it. The good thing about that was nobody wanted me at that hour. Three hour practice, that's a lot. Was it two hours of asana, an hour of pranayama? No, I did not have pranayama practice at that time. You were doing three hours of asana? Three hours of asana. Wow. And then how did you decide what you were going to do that day? Just how you felt? Or did Just you, how did, I felt, yeah. So I know that uh, the Iyengars had this schedule where the first week is standing poses and the second week is forward bends. Is that right? Yeah. And so did you do that? or did, no. no. you you did what you felt like you should do. What I felt was important for my body. <clears throat> okay, so... Mr. Anger clearly gave you discipline, yeah. so he gave you confidence and discipline. Well, like I could not do full arm balance, which is a very primary thing within the system. So I really badly wanted to do it. And because of this kind of practice I had, when I woke up one day at three o'clock, I just before waking up, I had a dream that I could get up into full arm balance. So I got up. I went into the yoga room, I had a room for that, locked the door so nobody would come in even and, and kept doing it and throwing myself up at the wall, trying to jump up. And I finally got there on that day. After that, I never had trouble getting up. But it also, that, that process taught me something that Mr. Iyengar had never taught, which is if you can't get up, stay away, walk towards the wall and just do like a somersault up. So I started teaching that way using some, you know, mm -hmm. protection and so on. And I got many people going up into full arm balance. At this point, you weren't going up though. Are you mm. saying after the fact? You after got... the fact. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. So I'd pile up a lot of bolsters against mm -hmm. the wall and tell people, come and go up, put your hands beyond the bolster and go up. So I would help them in the beginning. But it was amazing how many people who thought they could not go up started getting up. So I removed one bolster, then the second one, then the third one. And they said, look, you don't need any bolster, you can get up. It's your mind that is telling you I can't get up. Okay, so that, that brings me to another question is you said he gave you confidence as a practitioner, he taught you discipline as a practitioner, and now you're kind of mentioning a little bit how that went into your teaching. How did he affect your teaching? I mean, you were teaching before you met Mr. Iyengar, um, and then you went to the institute a, a number of times and became um, one of his one of his probably most enthusiastic students for a long time. How did that affect your teaching? You know, one time he puts me on the platform from where he is teaching, which was I'm told was very unusual. But he puts me on the platform, so I do the pose, sort of mirroring the rest of the class. After a while, he says, now you teach. And I said something, and he said, no, not like that. Say it like I am saying, which I did not particularly care for because that's not my style of teaching. Right. Like when I say, like in, in, uh, in uh, Paschimottanasana, I said, rotate the legs in, and I point out with my fingers how to rotate. He says, no, can't you say rotate from inside out? Which to me meant to put the hands inside and rotate it out. And whether it's from inside out or from outside in, in my engineering mind made no difference at all. So I thought, you know, he wants me to become a parrot, right. which was against my upbringing. So what did you learn from that, that you weren't going to teach more like him? <laughs> did, did that just um, reinforce no. that? No, that I can use the language as I feel comfortable and as I feel my students understand me. And he changed that later. Like in, in, in Pune, I remember him saying, you people don't understand me, Ramanand will go and teach you in your own language. 
So he kind of gave me permission to say, yes, you can teach the way you want. But I have to think that your teaching significantly changed after studying under Mr. Iyengar for a while. Yes, um, that's a longer story, but when I met Mukesh and I got exposed to the effect of the sound, then my cha teaching changed considerably. We're going to save that story for the next video, because <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a good story. Um, but, uh, okay, so, all right, so you say confidence and discipline, and is there anything else that you feel like, Mr. Iyengar changed my life from from before I knew him. No, those, those, those things. It's like, <clears throat> in a sense, like yoga practice, you know, instead of having a variety of practice of many, many poses, concentrate on two or three poses. Those poses will teach you about other poses. So when I say it, he, he gave me confidence and little whatever, okay, then the idea was focus on that. Don't look at what else he gave. Because, like with every great master, you know, if I look at defects in the person, uh, there are enough negative things I can point out. Right. Yeah. Similarly, if I look at good qualities also, there are many, many good qualities. But out of all those, the ones that are most relevant to me is what I would focus on. So, if we go with confidence and discipline or what you got from him, um, do you feel as a, as a yoga teacher that is the greatest thing you can give from my perspective from, yes. as you're a teacher yeah. to your students yeah. is confidence in their own abilities yeah. and discipline. even with Helena Thomas I remember I asked her one time I said I have a question you know what would you do with a student who won't practice and her beautiful English response was what would you do with a student who doesn't <laughs> practice There's nothing the whole secret is in practice. If somebody doesn't practice, you can encourage them to practice. But if they don't, then... Well, as see, the idea is not I am helping them. The idea is the practice is helping them. Yeah. My description of your effect as my teacher for over 20 years is that you, I find you incredibly inspiring. And when I'm inspired by you, it makes me want to do yoga and want to be better. Did you feel that way about Mr. Iyengar? No, not really. Mm, interesting. I, even though I had more confidence and I felt more better able to do things and I had discipline. I remember one time I was teaching in the class and I, I did something with a very strong person in the class. So afterwards when we walked out, he was a contractor and a carpenter, a very, very strong man. He looked at me and said, Ramanand, I don't think you know how strong you are. So I <laughs> maybe pushed him a little too far. Oh, interesting. But I remember other occasions, like when we are traveling, you know, you have to pick a big bag up or something. I could do it. My sense wasn't that I'm that strong. But when I found other people are not able to pick this bag up and I still can, it would surprise me. So I was stronger than I thought I was. It was Mr. Iyengar who really taught you that. You yeah, taught me. Yeah. So you you don't feel like he inspired you? That's so interesting to me. It was it was him you being in the classroom, uh, being pushed is really what. That's what really did it. I don't think he inspired me in the sense that I think he inspired everybody. It's not that it did not inspire me. It's more that everybody had that effect. Everybody? Everybody was inspired by him. Uh -huh. when, you, when I saw him practicing, that was an inspiration. But I felt like everybody got that. I was not special in any sense. Yes, but we're all on our own path. So yeah. that inspired you. Um, I mean, clearly your years with him changed your life. I mean, you were able to quit your, quit your job as an engineer and become a full-time yoga teacher. Yeah, maybe I'm looking at the word inspiration in a different way than you are looking, which is, it's got to be more specific, unique to me. I see. Mm -hmm. If everybody gets it, then 
I, I might have a different word for it. What would that word be? There is a collective inspiration, which is not mine. It's everybody's. Okay, so what, um, what drove you to be able to become a full-time yoga teacher and, and leave your <laughs> secure job? And No, I did not leave the job. I was fired from the job. <laughs> Okay. And I was I was Would very upset. Would you call upset. that your karma? <laughs> yeah. No, very upset, very angry. It was a racist decision mm. taken by somebody who is from head office in Chicago. He did not know me. In my engineering office, I could do several things, and yet I was the one that was fired, just because it you know it bugged the ego of this person. Okay, so you got fired, which ended up being everyone else's good good fortune. Um, so uh, then you decided, maybe I'll just try to make it as a yoga teacher? Yeah, I went home and I talked to my wife. <clears throat> and I said, you know, this is what happened. It's completely unfair. But I don't want to sue the people and anything. I'm not interested in that. So she says, but you always wanted to teach yoga. So now why don't you try it? She had a good job as a nurse, so financially, I was not too anxious. So at that point, you'd been teaching just on the weekends. Yes. And Thursday afternoon. And Thursday. Yeah. And then, and then you went to what? How many classes? And I started teaching. I think except Monday every day. Wow. And at that point, the institute existed. Existed. So you were able to take classes there and you taught, you were living in the peninsula? I was not point? teaching in the institute, I was teaching from my home. Okay. And I had a studio in San Jose. But do you think you would have been able, would you have had the confidence to do that without, without your studies with Mr. Anger? I don't think I would have given up the engineering job. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because financially that was definitely a little frightening. Mm. 